could The Empire Strikes Back be the best Star Wars film? The Empire Strikes Back is going to be the success of the season. Everyone who saw the Rebel forces battle it out on the big screen will be compelled to relive the excitement in their own living room. And for the few who missed it, here's the chance to meet Luke Skywalker, the irrepressible Han Solo, beautiful Princess Leia, and newcomer to the Rebel forces, Lando Coressia. Everybody loves the robot-turned-rebel C-3PO and his android companion, R2-D2. And the giant strength of Chewbacca. No. As my previous video admits, I don't believe Star Wars fans could ever agree on what Star Wars is, and I don't think we should. But with that being said, The Empire Strikes Back is my personal favorite Star Wars film and I think it might be the most influential sequel in film history for a very good reason. Star Wars today is a tangled mess of a saga similar to a snake eating its own tail as they revolve around the same creative well. But there was a time when Star Wars was not as set in stone. In 1980, there had only been the unfathomably popular 1977 film and the bizarre and loathed 1978 holiday special. And you could see from the special that many things we take for granted today as staples of Star Wars were not always thought of as inherent. From the opening crawl, we can tell something is wrong. The font, the size, the color, the timing, the music, all of it feels off. Even the lighting of the Millennium Falcon's cockpit is strangely dark and stagnant. And the problems do not stop there. I don't know why I said it like that. The Empire Strikes Back did not invent the elements we all intrinsically know as Star Wars today. But it did set them in stone for the saga, and in a lot of ways it improved things. The reason The Empire Strikes Back is my favorite Star Wars film is because better attention is given to the actual artistry of filmmaking. And to clarify, this is not a diss on A New Hope. The production, time, and budget were extremely limited compared to those given to the sequel. And it's less that A New Hope suffers from lacking anything, and it's more that The Empire Strikes Back benefits from coming after A New Hope. If the siege on Hoth had been done in 1977, it would not be as good. If Dagobah was not an atmospheric perfect set and looked more like the trash compactor, it would be lame. If the budget and production of A New Hope had to handle Cloud City in the underbelly of Vespin, it would have been a flat, bland, Death Star lit room. So it is only because of the success and lessons learned from the Star Wars that its sequel, The Empire Strikes Back, is able to be such an improvement and worthy film successor. Something is wrong with me though, because rather than articulating my love for The Empire Strikes Back by continuing to waffle on about its filmic beauty and deep but simple philosophical meaning, I want to talk about how of the six films before Disney, this is the Star Wars film George Lucas had the least creative control on, and that's why I love it. Young me certainly believed that, but as I've grown older it's become more clear The Empire Strikes Back is my favorite because George Lucas knew the film needed a more character-oriented direction style, and the complexion of the narrative required someone with a better understanding of film language. So he geniusly asked his film professor, Irvin Kirshner, to direct the film. Kirshner was known for smaller, quirkier films like The Flim Flam Man and Spies. With spies like these, who needs enemies? So he wasn't the obvious choice for your epic space opera, and it takes a bold and egoless mind to decide to mix this with the formula of Star Wars. When I say the Star Wars formula, I'm not talking like mathematical formula in which the story is a plug and play, just find X and Y, and then Bob's your uncle, you have a Star Wars. Instead, I mean formula like chemical, medicinal, a witch's brew whose potency and purpose can be changed with a sprig of Kirshner behind the camera, a dash of Lawrence Kasdan in the script, and a good helping of the ever-charming Billy D. Williams in the cast. Every criticism I have of George Lucas post-Empire Strikes Back, and especially in the prequels era of his film production style, is spelled out by Lucas himself in the behind-the-scenes material as reasons why he knew he needed to trust The Empire Strikes Back to somebody else. Mark Hamill talks in an interview about how Irvin Kirshner is more direct about what he wants and needs for the scene and from the production than George Lucas is. Uh, Kirshner is more vocal about what he wants, you know. I think George knows what he wants, but he sort of would rather maneuver you into it without having to come out and say, do this. And I think The Empire Strikes Back benefits greatly from a veteran director who is willing to take the reins and control the film's vision. Carrie Fisher spoke in an interview about the confusion an actor has when working on a film like Star Wars, where so much of the film is special effects done in a warehouse months after filming is finished. But when there's a lot of action, you're given lines sometimes two minutes before the scene goes on. You know that you probably will have to loop the dialogue anyway because there's so much noise. So they just give you impossible dialogue to say. You can type it, 
like Harrison says, you can type it fine, there's no way to say it. So you can't, you can't justify it, you can't sort of say, wait, wait, stop everything, stop all the explosives and the special effects, excuse me. Now when I'm saying this thing about all the troops on Sector 12 to the South Slope, what is Sector 12? Actually, what is Sector 12? I don't know what Sector 12 is, I have to admit it. And I am certain trusting George Lucas in 1976 before Star Wars was a huge success was way harder than trusting Kirshner in 1979 with The Empire Strikes Back. So the film is a credit to the humble brilliance and hard work of George Lucas. And looking at behind the scenes material, it seems he was still involved in every aspect he could be. Which makes sense, he is the creator and he would want to keep an eye on production, especially after reportedly going completely hands off with the Star Wars Holiday Special a few years prior. Harrison Ford gives a similar interview to Carrie Fisher and Mark Hamill about the difference between being directed by Irvin Kirshner and George Lucas, and I think Harrison Ford most poignantly explains the difference between the two directors. Kirshner is much taller. Now that I've sufficiently beaten you over the head and confused you about filmmaking directors and Star Wars, you might be asking yourself, what is The Empire Strikes Back? An epic of alien worlds. <coughs> and the climactic clash between good and evil. Join the further adventures of Luke Skywalker, Princess Leia, Han Solo, Lando Calrissian, C-3PO, R2-D2, and Chewbacca in a spectacular new episode of the continuing Star Wars saga, The Empire Strikes Back. The Empire Strikes Back is the best film of Star Wars. I feel confident in saying this even after saying there could be no best Star Wars movie. Because I'm not saying The Empire Strikes Back does the Star Wars elements the best, but it does them in the most cinematic way, making it the best film of Star Wars, but not necessarily the best Star Wars on film. To explain this, I would like to tell a college tale of academic woe and social exile. When I got my undergraduate degree, I took a lot of courses on film theory and history which usually ended with big multi-thousand word essays and video presentations about a director as an auteur or how a film's success or production affected the wider world of cinema. In my final semester, one of the other students in these classes, a really funny guy named Nate, did his presentation on the film production of Revenge of the Sith and sort of talked about how their assembly line from script to screen had bled over into modern blockbusters like your Harry Potters, your Pirates of the Caribbean, your Marvels, and your sequel Star Wars films. His presentation was very good and he had clearly done a lot of behind the scenes research into the varying pre-post marketing productions, but I could tell he approached his research as a Star Wars fan and not a film fan because he talked about a lot of the problems with Revenge of the Sith's production like they were impressive feats. My perfect example came near the end of his presentation when he talked about the Anakin vs Obi-Wan Mustafar fight, which does have quite a few groundbreaking blends of photographic, miniature, and computer generated effects in it. But my friend Nate talked about the sword fight itself and the long weeks of training both Hayden Christensen and Ewan McGregor did to keep the speed, intensity, and prowess required of such a climactic fight. And it is truly impressive for a production to take the time and the resources to do that like The Matrix did six years earlier. But a problem arose when it came time to actually put the fight onto digital film. The speed they trained at was too fast and their movements didn't pick up well on the camera. Nate presented this with a huge impressed smile on his face because he loves Star Wars and the thought that the actors portraying these characters were doing Star Wars so good in real life it wouldn't translate onto film makes it the best Star Wars. But for me, a film fan coming to Star Wars, that's poor filmmaking. If you have to change months of rehearsal because it turns out it looks like crap when you actually film it, then you have not been rehearsing, training, and sword fighting for film. In the heat of the film, when emotions are running high and I, the audience member, am supposed to be swept up in this Romeo and Juliet-esque epic in which I've already forgotten I know how it ends, I'm not supposed to stop and lean forward in my chair to go, but wait, technically this is very impressive. And yet, months of production and Nate's presentation seem to be telling me the point of the Mustafar fight was to be impressed by the sword choreography. <laughs> Say what you will about the throne room fight in Last Jedi, at least it looks good in motion. 
Without stopping every other frame and overanalyzing the background, it effectively communicates the meaning of the movie and the point of the scenes in a fun and kinetic way, which is ultimately the goal of filmmaking, and especially making a Star Wars film. Movies are moving images, lights and shadows that trick us into finding meaning in motion. A good movie uses every frame, every trick of the light, every sound, and every image on its screen to communicate the meaning of the movie and the point of the scene. If you have to rewind, slow down, and freeze frame to see someone in the background not holding a weapon, maybe that's bad Star Wars, but it's not bad filmmaking. Has anyone noticed how bad of a fight this actually was? Look at this! Watch his two weapons! And now he has one! Where did his other weapon go? It literally disappeared. And things like this happen over and over in this fight, and I'm gonna sit down and see if I can find each one. I don't know if you're a big Star Wars fan like me, but even if you aren't, chances are you've heard about how bad of a movie The Last Jedi was. The Star Wars suffered from a lack of belief, understanding, production time, and funds. So things like sword fight choreography and doing Star Wars right were afterthoughts to making the film function in motion. But as the sequel, Empire Strikes Back had a license to take the time to do the Star Wars elements right and we can see every aspect of the film is cranked up a notch. Even the sword fighting is turned up to 11, and we can see Mark Hamill trained like a mad dog for this film, not only in the behind the scenes footage, but on the movie screen as well. And this wasn't done to be as intense or as epic a fight as technically possible, because The Empire Strikes Back isn't concerned with being the best Star Wars. Empire Strikes Back and the sword fight between Luke Skywalker and Darth Vader is concerned with the emotion and the meaning of the fight and the film uses every tool it has to communicate this to the audience. What is the meaning? Concepts of good and evil, light and darkness, are all human concepts that we created to fight each other in our own stupidity. But as time goes on, these concepts create their own problems and wars are fought over them. Language, words, everything we know is contextualized and understood through text and people who existed and understood the world before we did. Luke is taught about the Force from a certain point of view and given context to a religious war that has been raging long before his birth in A New Hope, and so Empire Strikes Back is about deconstructing that point of view in order to reach towards the narrative truth of what the Jedi should be fighting. The Empire is the problem, and Darth Vader is the physical embodiment of that problem. In A New Hope, Luke blows up the Death Star, the Empire, the problem, and spirals Darth Vader, the physical embodiment, out into space. But the problem returns. The Empire strikes back and Darth Vader is leading the charge. Luke goes to Dagobah to learn how to defeat the problem, but upon facing the problem in practice, he only finds himself. His own misunderstanding of the problem prevents him from truly being able to defeat the Empire. He stands in his own way. The film is reaching into Luke and pulling out imagery to try and show him he does not understand everything. It strips away everything he understands about being a Jedi. He didn't think a Jedi Master could be a little green creature, he didn't think the Force was strong enough to lift the X-Wing, and that is why he failed. Luke can't see past his own horizons and believes the extent of his vision is the limit of the galaxy. Once we strip away everything Luke thought a Jedi was, I am left asking, why does Luke want to be a Jedi? Why does he want to fight Darth Vader and the Empire? The film answers this by telling Luke the Empire and Darth Vader the problem threaten his friends. And Luke says, shut up Obi-Wan, shut up Yoda, the answer is simple. I fight the Empire because they are mean to my friends. And they try to warn him that it's because the problem knows him too well, that it calls him to it and knows to target his friends. And even when Luke arrives on Cloud City, Leia tells him it's a trap, as her and Han Solo are already being carted away from him. But he ignores her and keeps going until he's trapped in the duel with Darth Vader. Han can't be rescued, and Lando helps Chewie and Leia escape, so other than Luke being a good distraction for Vader, his being there doesn't help the situation. Vader tells Luke he isn't a Jedi Master yet and drops hints that he and Obi-Wan know some great truth, but Luke can't accept that. The Mentor of Light and Defender of Darkness share nothing in his naive mind. Luke's inability to accept the truth makes defeating him all too easy. All too easy. Luke gets a spurt of narrative force and is able to escape Darth Vader, because his brashness and ignorance are hand in hand. Just as he doesn't understand what he really fights for, he also doesn't understand when he should stop fighting. The story gives Luke a chance to escape the duel and meditate and talk to Obi-Wan, or find Leia and Yoda and ask what all this destiny stuff is about. But instead, he follows Vader further down. Why is Luke continuing to fight Darth Vader? His excuse for coming here was to save his friends, but Leia's already escaped and Han's been taken by Boba Fett. The film answers this by having Darth Vader be silent and evil to Luke, because 
Darth Vader is the villain, and we fight him because he wants to rule the galaxy with his problematic empire, which is now attacking Cloud City. But the film is also challenging this idea by having Darth Vader continue to not kill Luke. He just wants him to listen, but Luke believes there is nothing he can learn from the dark side because obviously they must be nothing but wrong, stupid monsters, the opposite of the Jedi. Vader offers to complete Luke's training in that together they could overthrow the Emperor and rule the galaxy together, but Luke crawls away, still resists. Why? Darth Vader no longer threatens him or his friends, and he's kind of asking for civil discussion. We accept that Luke is pissed and in the middle of a fight where emotions are running high, so this is a very human moment, but it's a very un-Jedi moment, as opposed to the calm, collected Darth Vader practicing un-Sith-like diplomacy. The film has shattered all perceptions, beaten the mind of its hero until he ended up in the inverted narrative center where he emotionally crawls away, scarred to the dangerous ledge, while Darth Vader monologues at him about balance in the Force from stable foundation. Sith and Jedi, good and bad, light and dark, all of these have been proven just concepts in the wind, but he still resists. Why? And here Luke gives the final reason why he knows he has to keep fighting Darth Vader and he can't trust what his filthy Sith mouth says. And it's because good old Ben Kenobi said Darth Vader killed his father. And the person who killed his father must be evil. And here, the film strips away the last fiber of understanding Luke has, telling him not only is his father alive, but he is Darth Vader. That's not true. Impossible. This revelation that his father is both Sith and Jedi teaches Luke the ultimate lesson of what a Jedi is fighting for, truth. The ultimate truth, as discussed, is contextualized and understood through the people who came before us. And the people we all unanimously rely on to contextualize the world and life to us is our parents. And they themselves relied on their parents who relied on their parents, and on and on it goes. If one piece in the chain of history and misunderstanding is broken, you end up battling your own father on a technological utopia in the clouds without even knowing it. If a certain point of view is taken as the truth, you find yourself almost shooting your own son in the back in defense of a genocidal death machine. The truth Darth Vader tells Luke requires him to distrust Yoda, Obi-Wan, and everything he thought about the Force. But he still doesn't know if he can trust Darth Vader's truth. In this, not being able to continue standing on the path of the Jedi and fear to step onto the path of the Sith, causes Luke to fully trust in the thrust of the Force and the meaning of Darth Vader's words that he is more powerful and serves more of a purpose than he knows. The egotistical childlike version of Luke we see crawling away from Darth Vader, his father, at the end of Empire Strikes Back, dies on Cloud City as a more mature Luke emerges in Return of the Jedi. How Luke sees Darth Vader is how he sees the world, and so when Darth Vader becomes more complex to him, the world becomes more complex. In a single moment, Luke grows up and loses his infantile foundation of understanding, but life without foundation is like dangling on a hook waiting to fall into the abyss or be swallowed up by some metaphorical bigger fish. So he searches for anyone he can trust and lands on Leia. I would now like to quote from Joseph Campbell's The Hero with a Thousand Faces. Atonement, at one moment, consists in no more than the abandonment of that self-generated double monster. The dragon thought to be God, superego, and the dragon thought to be sin, repressed id. But this requires an abandonment of the attachment to ego itself, and that is what is difficult. One must have a faith that the father is merciful, and then a reliance on that mercy. It is in this ordeal that the hero may derive hope and assurance from the helpful female figure, by whose magic he is protected through all the frightening experiences of his father's ego-shattering initiation. For if it is impossible to trust the terrifying father face, then one's faith must be centered elsewhere. And with that reliance for support, one endures the crisis, only to find, in the end, that the father and mother reflect each other, and are in essence the same. Thank you. The Empire Strikes Back is about the egotistical backlash that happens when anyone is proven wrong or fails, and how we psychologically refuse to accept our own ignorance and flaws, because we are all children who want to rule the galaxy, and naively think we already have the tools, knowledge, and holy justification to destroy those opposed to us, even when we are proven wrong at every turn, and punished at every stop. No light speed. This is not my fault.
The film utilizes its tools to speak to the raw human experience of existing in a world full of history that expects you to act without the full context, and how even those trying to help you can lie worse than those opposed to you. I love The Empire Strikes Back because to me, it's the lesson you need to learn to escape childhood and to truly make change in the world. Why so influential? If your film ends in a cliffhanger and is meant to set up your final film in a trilogy, it's probably inspired by The Empire Strikes Back. But I think the film's influence springs from deeper in the film than its ending. I think The Empire Strikes Back is one of the most influential sequels of all time because it took the already popular and dreamlike elements of its original Star Wars and somehow made a dream of those dreams. In our stories of myth and heroes, the first part of a three-part journey is spent awake, learning about the world we live in and the problems one may face in it. The second part of the journey is spent in dream, where elements of the world are swirled and twisted to the point of being almost unrecognizable, and the hero is crushed and confused by these new yet familiar creatures until he awakens with a new perspective, and often a blemish, a token, or a wound to remind him his dream holds power in meaning outside of sleep. Irvin Kirshner perfectly replicated our dreamlike mythology of understanding the world in both film and in Star Wars with The Empire Strikes Back, and I believe it's why the film still holds a massive influence on our culture. Even if you haven't seen Star Wars, you know Darth Vader and you know he's Luke's father because of the influence of Empire Strikes Back. And I would like to let Irvin Kirshner say to himself why he thinks the film is so powerful. Logically, I don't think anybody can ever determine what's going to be successful. The thing that I love about this picture is the fact that it is not logical. And that's why I think people in many countries can experience it. Because um, they're experiencing something that, that is cross-cultural. Uh, it's, the, it's the common dream that they're experiencing. If you come from a highly technological society, or if you come from a very primitive society, the thing that you have in common is that you all dream uh, from childhood on. And those dreams carry over into your everyday life. And a really exciting story often has dreamlike qualities where taboos are considered okay to experience, where you can go places where in your real life you would never go, where you can feel things that in your real life you have no chance to, to feel or experience. And this is extra logical. This is not thinking things through and saying, well, this means so and so and this is why this happens. It goes beyond that. It goes really into the realm of the unconscious. It goes into the fairy tale, into the story. Uh, and it goes back into prehistory, the elements that you try for in a good story. Some people may not like a cliffhanger ending or the more somber tone of The Empire Strikes Back's closing shots, but that's kind of the point of the movie. And for me, a misunderstanding of this is a misunderstanding of the original trilogy. If the Star Wars is our infantile understanding of life as being an epic journey where some bad things happen and we lose some people, but ultimately, we kill the baddies, save the girl, and get the medal then The Empire Strikes Back is the somber, more mature approach to understanding life as an ongoing struggle against history, the future, and the calls to action of the present. And so, its ending, while not being the big childlike vision of a victory parade, is the more mature understanding that a happy ending is being alive with friends, and having hope that you can continue to do good and rescue more friends. The ending uh, may jar them only because they saw Star Wars 1 and there was a triumphant ending where everyone was successful and were, were patting each other on the back and were handing medals out and giving gold to each other. I mean, they were, and people were lined up paying homage to them because they were heroic figures. Well, the heroic figures for the first one don't exist in this one because in this one, they're lucky to have survived this dastardly creature called Lord Darth Vader. And to just have survived is, uh, is to get pretty far in this life sometime. <laughs> and that's why I feel uh, they probably say uh, they're not as satisfied. Well, if you don't expect the triumphant ending, then you're perfectly well satisfied. If you expect it, then you're not. And it's the same as in life. If you expect certain things to happen, they never will happen the way you expect them, you know. And it's always the unexpected that happens, of yeah, course. Yeah, I always expect the unexpected. Mm. Always expect the unexpected could perhaps be a thesis for all of Star Wars, 
but I think it fits the Empire Strikes Back the best, as it is clear through interviews, Irvin Kirshner truly does live his life by this rule, and has imbued this illogical logic into every frame, every trick of the light, every sound, every image, every vista, every set, every monster, droid, blaster, bonk, smack, and shot to the head Luke takes in The Empire Strikes Back. And that is why The Empire Strikes Back could be the best Star Wars film if such a thing ever did exist.